So I want to welcome you to our webinar on how to lower your force measurement uncertainty. Uh, before we get started, I want to give a little bit of background about Morehouse Instrument Company and what we do. Uh, we manufacture force calibration products such as um, a universal calibrating machine, deadweight calibrating machine, and portable calibrating machine. Uh, these types of machines help to measure and calibrate uh, force. We also provide um, equipment uh, to use uh, using international standards. Uh, these standards allow us to lower uncertainties of our customers' equipment. So we enable other cust our customers to make better measurements, which makes the world a safer place. Uh, we also have a calibration laboratory where we offer force and torque calibrations at a very high level of accuracy. We're a primary standards lab and offer deadweight calibrations up to 120,000 pounds of force known to within 0.002% of applied force. Uh, we also offer other force calibrations up to 2.25 million pounds or 10 meganewtons of force known to within 0.01% of applied force. And uh, we're talking about force today, uh, but I do also want to mention that we have uh, torque calibration. We have the second most accurate torque standard in the world, which was purchased from the National Physical Laboratory in England. And for torque, we have uncertainties of better than 25 points per million. So the reason why we do this and, and our purpose as a company is to create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. And so today, that's why we're presenting this webinar. Our presenter today is Henry Zumbrun, who's been the president of Morehouse since 2013 and worked at Morehouse for more than 20 years. Henry has a passion for measurement accuracy and reducing risk associated with measurements that impact the safety in our day-to-day -day lives. One thing I've learned from Henry is just the far-reaching impact of force measurements on everything from the planes we fly in to the bridges we ride on and the cars we drive. So now I'm going to pass the presentation over to Henry. Thanks, Heather. This is my contact information, this guy. I need to update my picture, you know, maybe draw some horns on it, do whatever. So anyway, as, as Heather said, a bit of a passion uh, for metrology. This week we are going through a new PIC audit for 10 CFIR um, part Appendix B. And we have six auditors here with us so we're giving the webinar in between that but in the even the, like the discussions this morning we're talking about you know the passion for metrology the passion for what we do and some people uh you know label me a little bit of bit of a, a pessimist when it comes to this stuff and it's it's basically because there is so much that you need to do that's on your plate and there are so many labs that miss things um, even during this audit you know none of us are perfect uh to say and if you dig deep enough you're always going to find something someone didn't check a box here um this one uh today specifically today we were um talking about software and software validation and platform we didn't we didn't have platform on our stuff that you know like a windows 10 uh we didn't have that platform we had uh you know revision numbers all that other stuff so you know we're learning as we grow and we grow together as a community so the often say hey thank you for your time attending this this webinar this morning this one's a, a hopefully a more of a far-reaching webinar where we can help people we can help people make better measurements or the, the decision makers hopefully we have some decision makers that are that are on the call and take away some of this this pessimistic attitude that i have uh because it really stinks uh right now it's it stinks as far as someone just bought all of this equipment from someone else they're sending it to the lab and they're getting uncertainties that are rather high because the stuff that they bought <coughs> excuse me does not have good stability so today we're going to talk about you know how to lower your force measurement and uncertainty part of that is with the equipment if you buy something the stability is high, that goes into an uncertainty budget. People don't consider it. So that's that's one of the things. And then today we're really going to talk about, we get asked, we go out and train, and we get asked a lot about how do I lower my force uncertainties? So it's a great question. Um, and we're going to cover it. We, we did a three-legged stool approach, which we've done before. Um, 
for for risk which is a, a next month w webinar or you can go online and view our older one but this one will be a, a bit updated but so we're going to do that and we're going to talk about it and as a participant we learn major contribution contributors to uncertainty I already gave one which is stability some are which are known others which might be hidden everyone should leave with an understanding of what actions they can immediately take these range from very cost effective solutions to some that may require more significant investment we have the tentative agenda different people come in with different expertise we have what is measurement uncertainty three rules to lessen your force uncertainty and additional and some additional good practices that being said some people still say hey traceable to nist i don't like that uh the the proper def the proper way to say things is traceable to si units through an nmi if you want to say that but uh, when we talk about metrological traceability the definition is right here from the vim it says a property of a measurement result whereby the result can be related to a reference or a documented unbroken chain of calibrations each contributing to the measurement uncertainty here is the si here is your nmi when people say traceable to nist they are in essence saying hey we need to all be traceable to this si and we need to be traceable through the nmi such as this so i'd like people to stop with that habit of you know this traceable what does that mean if you look at this chain here you have si you have an nmi primary standards accredited labs field measurement well this field measurement if somebody says traceable to this the uncertainties could be really 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 high if you're going this whole way back to this and maybe someone's in a quality system uh, or purchasing department and they don't realize if I buy equipment from this laboratory here, my measurement capability cannot be better. My measurement uncertainty here cannot be better than the laboratory that performed this calibration for me. And we have to do a lot of other things, which we'll talk about. So. Our first question of the day for everybody, because we have uh, polling questions, and that's if I can get the, the polling up, I just, I just had it. But when you start thinking about it, you start thinking about um, doubt, what is, what is measurement uncertainty as we do that? I always... So you're oh. going to see um, in the right-hand side of your screen, uh, underneath the chat, a uh, bar called polling. In a minute here, Henry's going to pull up the new polling Maybe. question. Maybe. Well, I did it earlier, yeah. Heather. And and the question uh... is, uh, what is uncertainty? So the different answers here could be A, doubt, B, error, C, bias, or D, parameters characterizing the dispersion of values being attributed to a measure and based on the information used. Uh, so when the poll question comes up, we're going to have about one minute to uh, think about that and to answer the question, what is uncertainty? And it says some people cannot view this. So I apologize. It's here. Apologize. I see it's here. Yeah, for some, but it got the error message that says some people cannot view. So if you can't view, we're we apologize. We're using the Cisco platform and we have a and it should be multiple multiple choice. And as we go and as people are, you know, checking boxes so far, we have four that are not started, one in progress and uh, nine completed. With about a minute. So now three not started. Two seconds left. And they're waiting. So if we look at this, the majority of people are pretty well versed. You know, they're they're going with the definition here that's in the VIM, which makes life a lot easier for us in the training today. We can speed up some some things, uh, but they're going with the definition of the VIM of measurement uncertainty. But also that polling question also there's some people that think of uncertainty as doubt 
right, doubt the validity of the measurement. And there, I attended some NIST sessions when they really talk about that as a simple word to say, hey, doubt. But yeah, the, the proper definition of the, the right here, the per, parameter characterizing this version of the values. But everybody got that right, that answered. So congratulations. Makes it a lot easier to go through this. Uh, we typically break down the measurement uncertainties as type A's and, and type B's. And the easiest way I always see is to remember this is type A is statistical evaluation. And then your type B is methods other than statistical evaluation. So you could have based on information, uh, quantity values, value of a certified reference material obtained from a calibration certificate about drift, obtained from accuracy class, all this other type of information. Though if we look at this for force, I highly recommend that people have their standards either calibrated with ISO 376 or with ASTM E74. And those that are in North America, ASCM E74 is almost the de facto for standard. There's, you know, the E28 committee, we all meet, we put together the standard. It's been around since 1974. But if we do a proper uncertainty budget and we have our equipment calibrated in accordance with the E74 standard, that is typically going to be the lion's share on good equipment. That is typically going to be the lion's share of the uncertainty. So we're looking at how to re reduce our measurement uncertainty. We're going to start looking at how do we how do we purchase equipment that is going to give us that the best results as far as the ASTM E74 calibration is concerned. Now you can go to manufacturer spec sheets, which we'll talk about, and we can go to other things, but this is the, the standard in North America. Now, if you're overseas, global, ISO 376 might replace number one on this list, but everything else, pretty much, we're gonna do repeatabilities. We're gonna do R and R's, repeatability and reproducibility. We're gonna, then our type Bs are usually resolution. Those that, that attended some classes, we. You know, the last webinar resolution, we talked extensively about that. If you weren't part of that, you can go back and look at it. You reference standard uncertainty and so on. But down here, this this note, do not use SEB nonlinearity or hysteresis as they are not appropriate. And that's what we see. I go out and I see people doing this all the time. They have their standards calibrated in accordance with a known standard. And then they go to the specification sheet and they start pulling specs. Well, guess what? ASTM E74. Guess what that does? And ISO 376 does the same thing. We have all these force points, we take data, we do everything else, but those standards use the quadratic equation to characterize the instrument. And our line could look something like this, right? And when we use those equations, we can plot those coordinates of the line with very little error. That's the error is usually called interpolation error. error but we can plot it with very little error. And then through the statistical analysis, we determine how good this device is to this curve fit. Now, if we use a straight line, if somebody does away with this and just draws a, see how jittery I am. I'm not jittery, I, don't, I do not drink caffeine anymore. But if somebody draws a straight line you know, through the, through the data set, Look at, look at the potential difference. Now my line should be shifted up a little bit, but there's gonna be a lot more error trying to map those coordinates versus a quadratic, a, a higher order polynomial fit uh, versus just drawing a straight line. So if somebody goes and uses a nonlinearity spec, they're really doing the wrong thing because the standard has coefficients and when those coefficients are used, they will better define the way that uh, instrument is acting when it's calibrated. So we use this, and then we get to the expanded uncertainty, a standard measurement, and just basically we're gonna take all of that information on that last slide, and we're gonna combine everything. Usually, if we're gonna do it right, we're gonna do it using the well satherweight equation, uh, which found and recommended in the gum. And we're gonna take all of that, degrees of freedom, sample size, we're gonna take everything that we have and then we're gonna come up with and we're gonna multiply it by some number to get a confidence, to get our, our 
the right confidence interval. Typically, people say that number is two. Uh, depends on what you want to do. Uh, that number could be 196. If we go through the formula, the formula is going to tell us what that number is for the appropriate confidence level. So if we went 95%, we run it through the wealth satherweight equation. Maybe the K equals 1.98. Maybe K equals 2.04. This is starting to talk about good ways to do an uncertainty budget, which we have classes and webinars on that. So bottom line for force, you get primary standards are typically, you know, zero, you know, 10 parts per million to 50 parts per million. That's 0 .001 uh, to 0 0.005. And these are dead weights uh, without hydraulic mechanisms, levers, hydraulic, all the other things. They were, you know, they're adjusted for air buoyancy, local gravity. We're, we're going to show that formula a little bit. Then we have secondary standards, which are usually those standards calibrated by dead weights. And then working standards, dynamometers, crane skills, and everything else. And you can see as you start, this is the tier one, the best level uh, primary standards. You can see every time we do a calibration down this pyramid, the uncertainties grow. So back to traceability and lowering your uncertainty. I think people can start to put this together. So how do I lower my uncertainty? One of the best ways is to start by using labs with the very best standards, which are dead weights. Looking at this another way graphically, this came from ILAC G8. If I have a small uncertainty, namely dead weight, I have this very large acceptance window to make a conformity assessment. If I have, if I'm at tier two, tier three of that pyramid, my window starts to shrink and I have less. Very Simple concept, not everybody understands it, but it's a, it's a pretty simple concept. Three rules, I said we have a stool here, um, choose the right equipment, have the right system, and the right calibration provider. Pretty easy, and then, you know, always choose measuring and test equipment that can achieve the measurement tolerance required. Well, if your measurement, if somebody says, hey, my measurement tolerance is a number like 005%, uh, they're basically saying right now, eh, you're probably going to be stuck with dead weight. The only way I can do it. If somebody says my measurement tolerance is 1%, what do you think? The 1%, 1%, you go back to the pyramid, you could say, okay, 1% working standards are probably more than acceptable to, for a 1% if that's what I need to do. Uh, have the right system components. Uh, you know, having training program, proof of training to validate individuals performing the calibration or using the equipment. If I have a new technician, am I going to just assign them to do any customer stuff or am I going to bring them in? Am I going to do R&Rs? Am I going to, when I say R&Rs, that's a repeatability and reproducibility study. How am I going to, how am I going to validate their training? Uh, errors happen. We're all fallible. I spent over 15 years in the calibration laboratory and I can't tell you that 100% of the devices I sent out were, did not have errors. And it's kind of built in when you say 95% confidence and you start looking at statistics, you say every now and then we're going to make a mistake. And how critical or how much risk is in that mistake? Now, I can tell you I never made a major one, but even just the other day I was, I was running numbers and I had an error in a formula. I caught it. The error was 0.0007%. Whatever we ran through, it was using quadratic equations, and it was for me, and it was test data. It's, it's another giveaway we have coming out in the future. But when I was validating that sheet, and I, I sent it to a friend. I, I validated it. I said, something's a little bit off here. They came back. They confirmed. I had a little bit out, and, they, and they, my friend said, hey, look. Look at your error. It's 0 0.0007. You know, that's such a low error. It was never going to show if we're looking at resolution of the devices, unless uh, unless we had a device out at the you know sixth or seventh decimal, and we're typically reading force devices to the fifth. Though again, good practice on that validation side, and we all are fallible. And as techs, yeah, people transpose numbers. If you're transposing the last two digits, and it's um. 
a one a one one if the last two digits is a one two and it becomes a two one i've seen people have it all the time someone gets that data it's not going to change their data set that much but it is we're all fallible and that's why we should have the right system and quality checks to just limit those errors and we're really going to limit a lot of the glaring errors and the small ones can escape but hopefully they're uh we have enough detection in the system that the appropriate level of risk is such that when the small ones do escape they're there it's not anything major for for anyone else but as i said no system is infallible uh, and then you have the, yeah, the right calibration provider, knowing what level of uncertainty you need you for your calibration. So if we're doing the right uh, equipment for force, is, the calibra is it uh, calibrated or adjusted for force? This one's, this one's interesting because uh, on this side of things, a lot of people will buy weights and they'll use them for force. We see this a lot on, in, with torque and what they'll do even though this is a force class, uh, they do it for torque. They do it for force as well, but we see it a lot more on torque where they'll have a, a known length and then they'll have mass weights that they're hanging on the torque arm. And they'll say, okay, in my uncertainty budget, I'm good because I'm going to correct for my gravity. My error of gravity is 0.01. I'm going to add this 0.01% to the uncertainty budget. But I challenge people here. What if I ship that device elsewhere? That 01 is good when I make the, do the calibration. I know my gravity might be off by that if I'm using mass weights and I've determined it. What if it goes to Alaska? What if it goes to Texas? What if it goes to Florida? The difference in gravity between all these locations is much higher than 01. So we have a case where someone's not going to be reporting uncertainty correctly when they get that equipment. So it's very, very important that you have your weights adjusted for force if you're making force measurements unless the only caveat is unless it, you are doing it at the plant you're using mass weights at the plant you're creating the errors and that device is never leaving that location then then it's okay other part is is the equipment plumb level square rigid and has low torsion we're going to talk about this and replicate use actual use so first one, force is mass times acceleration. It's the, derived from, you know, three SI units. It requires the correction for the effects of local gravity, air buoyancy, and material density. Here's the formula. This is out of ASTM E74, uh, where M is the mass of the weight, gravity at a fixed location, air density, and material density. Everything we do in our lab is adjusted for force. So we make these big blocks of, we make these steel, sometimes we make them. Uh, we turn as much as we can. We do not turn, you know, eight foot weights. We subcontract that out. But what in, in that process, when you're manufacturing these and you're making weights, you put adjustment cavities in the weights and then you send it, we have equipment at NIST right now, you send it to NIST with target values and everything else. And you say, hey, these are my target values and NIST, NIST does the best that they can to get it in. And hopefully they get everything in target within maybe five parts per million or something like that, which will we'll go in your uncertainty budget. But it's adjusted. So we have stability. We have all these other things in our uncertainty budget, such, you know, stability, if, if you're manufacturing really good weights, stainless steel or plated weights, the stability, uh, NPL, physical laboratory in UK, did a stability study where the, the errors were about 0.2 parts per million over a 10-year period. These standards, the weights, do not change. You can have calibration intervals that are 50 years. NIST recalibrated half of their million-pound sack after about 50 years of use. And there was, the change was very insignificant. So they rechecked them, 50 years. Hopefully there's some good papers coming out of this and everything else, but not much changes when you do it right. You also need a measurement assurance program to make sure nothing changes. That's the caveat is, you know, I say, hey, someone questions us a lot of the times because some of our weights were calibrated in, you know, the 80s, 90s, uh, some in, you know, 2000, the big machine 2004. 
And we're not sending it back to NIST for recalibration, but we have a measurement assurance program. And we're doing ILCs, we're doing PTs, we're doing everything else. So when you buy a dead weight machine, you are buying the absolute best standard and you need to have it corrected for force. Equipment design. Uh, the best equipment is plumb level square rigid and free of torsion. And we're going to show some machines, not all of them. But when we say plumb, you're looking at a dead weight machine. You're talking about exactly true or vertical or uh, exactly vertical or true. The, the example here is here's a thousand pound automated dead weight machine. The picture I just showed like a while back was an older dead weight machine. We are a company of continuous improvement. And thus, if you look at this machine, you can see the heavier weights are on the top and the smaller on the bottom. That is basically because this distance here. So if you put a heavy weight on the bottom, you have a pendulum effect. You think about it, that the way these are engaged, these are on a spherical lifter. It's on a spherical or a conical lifter and airbags are lowered and the weights are placed on the device and they're transferred to the to the load cell or unit under test but if you have a small weight you can take a string put a small weight on a string and take um and put a large weight on a string and when you lift that weight off and on you're going to have more swing or the pendulum effect with the larger weight at the bottom so that basic properties of physics we've read the newer machines, we've inverted our weight stack, so the the ones, the heavier ones are on the top for that reason. And it also helps the weights hang better in the vertical direction. The right equipment for force is level. These machines come with levels. The more, the better you get your level on the machine, more than likely, the better you're going to have your repeatability and your reproducibility. I've seen that numerous, numerous times. We had a machine that was here, and they said it's ready for testing. I tested it. The numbers, It's this is in one of our blogs. We have many blogs on the site. I tested it, and the results were on the edge of passable, and I said, I expect better. And the one guy said, well, who told you to go test? And I said, uh, this this person over here, and they said we haven't leveled it yet. So after they leveled it, my the results improved by like a magnitude of four. I think about fourfold. There's a blog in that about dead weights on, on our website. About fourfold improvement from just tweaking the level. So very very important as far as reproducibility is concerned. Uh, the right equipment is free of torsion. These types of frames. Anytime you do a transfer of force between things, you're going to have you're going to have some type of torsion. The goal is to eliminate it, but you can't really eliminate it. So you're pulling on something or pushing on something, and naturally things tend to twist. So in our bulletin, or not our bulletin, in our product guide for the uh, PCM, this is a small handheld this is a small dead this is a small machine that's uh, 2000 pounds of of force and this machine is for up to 2000 pounds it eliminates like hand weights placing weights there's a lot of safety reason but when we first designed it, it the numbers weren't the greatest and we did a lot of work there at the top with uh, springs with bearings and everything else to really get the tor the error from torsion down if we just take a frame, say, I, I don't want to pick on them, but we'll, we'll put it out there. We'll, we'll take a frame like uh, press from Harbor Freight, which I've seen people use to, to make force measurements. And you put equipment on it and you pull it, you modify it or pull it and push it. You could have very, very large errors. And hence, hence why proficiency testing and ILCs are very, very important because on paper, Everything could look really, really good until you actually test. So even a measurement assurance program without that PT and ILC, I buy five Harbor Freight machines and test things, you know, between all those machines, I might get pretty good numbers. I need, really need to go external with, with uh, the known, with the lab, with the really low measurement uncertainty such as NIST or the labs using primary standards such as us to validate my claims.
So what we did here is we took two load cells calibrated by dead weight in one of our machine, put them in, ran a bunch of tests, made some changes, did it again and again and again and again and again and again until we got that error really, really low. And it's like, it's like brown, oh, I say less than 0 0.0, 0 0.02, it's less than 0 0.015 really. So equipment that replicates actual use. So we're gonna go out and do a field calibration, typically, Maybe we're going to do, you know, uh, calibrate a machine in compression. Maybe we're going to calibrate a machine in tension and compression. So the goal here does, is to say, hey, does this setup, this does compression and tension in the same setup. Does this replicate actual use? If I'm using one of these machines, does it, is it what I'm doing? Or am I taking that load cell, as I, am I putting it in a press that's a compressive test maybe i'm using that load cell in a lifting you know a chain to a crane to to do a lift you know does it replicate that um so common practice for cal labs is to put things in a machine and do that because it's really really quick i can go compression tension i can do an e74 calibration in about a half an hour versus in a dead weight machine it might take me three hours it might take me two and a half so time in a dead weight machine is going to be a lot longer than these machines. But you know what? The dead weight machine likely is going to replicate use. And they should use, when people are doing things, they need to use the customer's adapters, the customer's top locks to make separate uh, compression setups. And they should require a base plate to load against. For tension, if the end user is calibrating her ISO 7500, they kind of need to be using the ISO Annex, which is different than what is shown, much different than what is shown here. Actually, the ISO Annex is really a good guidance document. I think it's less than $100. It's ISO 376. But if anybody out there is using adapters for force measurement, making force measurements, that is a great standard to just peek at the Annex and say, and look at the recommendations for adapters for compression and tension. And they will recommend different setups for both. If we look at process uncertainties uh, down to the calibration provider, here's dead weight. Uh, this is a PFA sheet that we put together. This is going to be the giveaway on the December webinar on decision rules that anybody that attends can download sheets that can generate these graphs. Still tweaking it a little bit um, to do different things to show the different guard bands and whatnot. We added CPK, good buddy of mine convinced me we should add CPK. Uh, and we're looking at this. So dead weight, result, measurement, measurement value, 10,008, measurement error, bias is, is eight, I overdrew that arrow. But we look at this and the difference here is we're using our dead weight machine if we go to like a commercial lab secondary standards exact same exact same numbers all we did was change out the machine from dead weight to a secondary standard and our risk went from 0 to 6.1875 so if i'm making a conformity assessment is that good enough that's where you have the conversations with your customer most labs generally uh, method five and, and whatnot are looking to assure less than 2% risk. And if we look at this and we look at the actual risk, what is that 6.185? That's basically saying this tail here, about 6.1875% of this, when we draw it, is sticking out. So that, that would be my risk level. If we start evaluating global consumer risk, what happens in a scenario where, where a lab asks for a TAR or TUR of four to one? I don't, I'm not a big fan of TAR, it can work. We, there's two blogs that uh, uh, Heather just recently published if, if somebody's interested in reading it. And if you're looking at the new, the new version of Cal Lab Magazine, just wrote an article on uh, some history of TAR, TUR differences, uh, when TAR can work, when it doesn't work, uh, what, what's the importance of TUR. So, but they ask for that or some arbitrary number. Uh, some may say they, they have started to, some may say they have evaluated the level of risk. And my question is, have they? You know, you look at this, look at, look at this TAR number. Why I built out this PFA sheet, the ones beforehand didn't have this. TAR in this example, just test accuracy ratios, 
62 and a half, 62.5 to one. When we do the TUR formula, it's 16.69. However, when we look at the risk evaluation of where this thing sits on the line, 50% of it's over the curve in our CPK, which is our process capability index. That's a, we'll talk about that in December. That's basically taking, showing us, hey, where's this location of the measurement? And if my CPK is higher than 1.33, I may be okay. Ideal, I want it to be higher than, uh, I think, 166. So look at that. Let's change this uh, around a little bit, the location of the measurement. All we're doing, if you're not, it, you know, again, it met. If you want four to one, go back to the slide. If you want four to one, you have 16 to one. If you're TUR, TAR four to one, you have 62 and a half to one. But when we didn't, we didn't consider that location, the measurement, our risk was 50%. Here, guess what? TUR is the same, TAR is the same, and CPK 2.22 should be great. Risk zero. So we really need to consider the location of the measurement um, to consider risk properly. And we'll talk about more, more about that in December. Right system components, adapters, 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 load cells with the right specifications, indicators that are stable and have enough resolution. Importance of adapters, you know, keeping, keeping the line of force pure, free from eccentric forces is key to the calibration of load cells. You know, I, I said before, ASTM really doesn't address it. ISO 376 does. I, the, it's $100, $120, I think, for the standard. If someone goes to look at it. Last time we bought it, it's it was under 100 but inflation's crazy nowadays, so I don't know. I don't know where it currently is. So adapters. I send my equipment out to XYZ Calibration Lab. I just send them a load cell. I send them whatever. I don't put, it, put adapters in. Well, guess what? XYZ Lab, hey, if that's Morehouse, this is us. Someone did that. They sent us adapters. You can see the date. I was I was responsible for this one in 2017. So when I said 15 years, I probably should have said like 17, 18 years doing calibrations. But it's 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 dwindled off. Uh, here's a situation. Here's the data. Uh, 4340. That's the material top block. There's the data. Some rotation. We wanted to test this in rotation to see what kind of deviations we were getting. Hardened top block. Numbers, okay. Differences here from these two pictures. This picture over here was us performing the calibration without their top block because they didn't send it. Someone probably forgot to send it. They did whatever. They said, use yours. We looked at numbers, didn't match the previous calibration. Sends, they send their top blocks in. I run all these tests. I ran about a week of tests. This is just a snapshot of two days to really see how good this load cell was and everything else. Tell you what, coming away from this error of 0.3 on a device that they expected to be better than 025 of full scale. So 025 at full scale was over 10 times higher from just a top adapter. That's, these devices are very mechanical. Tension links, anybody that's seen this, I present this one all the time. It's in a lot of slides. Just engagement, the different pin size. All that is is this pin right here. We use pin sizes that were pretty close, 2.15 and, or I, yeah, I forget. Pin sizes that were within 0.2. Pin sizes that were within about 10% of the overall diameter and we got an error of 1.72%. Hence, we developed a adapters for these tensions, and here's all the different pin sizes and the right way to load these. And not only did we adapt them, we got a patent for it because it was a tedious, tedious task to do all the calculations and the design and everything else. And then typically what happens, you do it all and then somebody goes and knocks it off. So this is one that we protected and it's protected under this, this patent. So you look at manufacturers. Here, here we have two dynamometers, tension links, and 
they require different pin sizes, 2.0, 1.97. And someone will say, there's not much difference. The one's a 50 millimeter pin, the other's a two inch pin. Someone will say, there's not much difference. Well, there's enough. It's not a 1.72% difference, but it's enough to make a conformity assessment that you could call something bad when it's actually good or good when it's actually bad. Other adapters, uh, button, light, button load cells. People buy these. I'd like to throw away the specification sheets because once you rotate them, they're all over the place. This example here, uh, this is this is both of these are in dead weight, one with proper adapters, one without. And if you look at, if you get the alignment and everything else into place here, uh, the one with the proper alignment, we had a error of 0.199%. Without the proper adapters and like what most people do over here, the actual error when we tried to rotate this or reproduce the measurement condition was 1.045. If you look at the spec sheet, it's going to say something like 0.02. Or uh, actually, this one's going to be 0.02 to probably 0.1 is going to say. So if I just look at my specification sheet, if I'm in purchasing, I'm going to say, hey, what, what do I need to test? I need to test something that's, um, uh, let's do the typical four to one. I, I need to test something that's 1%. So I need this cell to be better than 0.25. Oh, it's good. Based on the specification sheet, I can go use this. Guess what? When you actually go and do the t actual testing, showed it was 1.045. Is that good enough to calibrate a 1% device? So if you want to learn more about adapters, we have webinars, videos, all kinds of stuff on adapters. This is this is the one that won best paper at NCSLI. Heather can send um, copies of this presentation. But back to specifications, because that's where I was leading. Uh, if, if you use load cells with the right specifications, if I used ASTM E74, ISO 376, does this specif if I'm doing anything to this standard, does this specification tell me what I need to know? What it does it tell me how well it's going to re you know in rotation? Does it tell me? It tells me some good stuff here. It tells me some side load sensitivity. It gives me my environmental for sure. This is really really important to look at. I like this. But what's non does nonlinearity tell me anything? If I'm going to fit it to a curve, not really. Right, safe overloads good, excitations good, creeps good. If I'm, you know, a long test, manufacturers can cheat all of these things. They can use, they can use a nonlinearity of O2. You can use higher order equations to say that it doesn't tell you what we did, how we got it. it doesn't tell you what we did for the creep specification. So, so many people get hung up on these specifications. They go look at it and they. They go, oh, I need this, this, this. What's your application, really? What is your application? Because a lot of places are doing things the same here. But here, here's the other sheet. Does this tell us more? If I look at this one, right? If I'm calibrating to ASTM E74, if I'm calibrating it in accordance with that standard, that tells me a lot more. It says, hey, in this, if I buy this load cell, I'm going to get a class A of better than 2% or a class AA better than 10% of capacity. So what's that tell me? Well, if I'm going to go out and do an E4 calibration, that's telling me why my loading range for an E4 calibration is going to be 2% to 100%. If I go back to this slide, I don't know how good my cal is going to be to E74. I go back to that button load cell where they're specking them at realistic, unrealistic low numbers when you start looking at looking at things. Is that, you know, I think the nonlinearity specs on some of those is like 0.15. Does that tell me anything? So, no, this tells me more, but you do need to do due diligence. Don't throw away the specification sheet because you still need to know operating temperature, environmentals, and some other things for your when you do your uncertainties. But not nonlinearity, not the stuff that people get hung up on. So, choosing the right indicator, you have different things here. If you have the sheet, there's here's indicators. This indicator is a high stability model. This is you know, general price, budget, everything else. This is a very good indicator 
This one requires the use of a computer. It does not have a display. It stacks up very well. Here's a situation that's fun because I'd say nonlinear doesn't matter too much if you're going with E74 on the load cell side because we're gonna calibrate it prescribed to that method. But on the indicator side, the better the indicator, the more stable the indicator, uh, the drift, everything else, this is, this is the equipment that you are better chasing the spec sheets on and better looking at the spec sheets. How much resolution do, do these indicators have? Here's a portable, a portable handheld one. We have equipment in our lab right now where, where somebody bought that type, this type of indicator and they have extremely high drift. Uh, and they're using it to do E70, they're doing, using it uh, to do field work. This indicator is appropriate for some things, but E74, probably not, depending what you're chasing, probably not the right indicator for it. So really need to understand. And if it's all confusing, we can talk to you. We talk to everybody all of the time. It's finding, it's having the discussion. Good companies will have the discussion and not try to sell you things that don't work for your application. And salespeople are out there from all types of organizations working on commissions and they just want the sale. That is not us. That is, we want the sale, but we're not gonna tell you to go buy this indicator. We're gonna listen to pain points. We're gonna listen to everything else. And we're gonna approach this together and see, does this make sense? Is this one the right fit for what you need to do? Because if we get it wrong, the headache comes a year later or two years later when it's calibrated again. Usually it's calibrated at, you know, the, after the first time someone purchases something, usually they're at six months to a year. So the headache's going to come and you're going to be disappointed. And what's it look like when you just bought a bunch of stuff and you're disappointed? Not good. Never a good situation. So indicators, we want them that are stable and have enough resolution. So here's a picture from if people took the last one, this is from the, the last presentation on resolution. If people took it, you can see as the resolution increases down here, this is percent contribution to the overall um, calibration and measurement capability. If you buy indicators with coarse resolution, that's more than likely gonna end up being the lion's share of the uncertainty. So we wanna have an indicator that's stable and has enough digits to properly resolve what we need it to. How to choose it, uh, you're going to have your accuracy and uncertainty requirements, uh, environmental conditions, four or six wire sensing. If I have pretty extreme environmental conditions, uh, long cables, temperature effects on cables, a four wire system can be problematic. We most likely want to go six wire, which is a 4215 or a Hattie. Load cell output, this one, uh, our, our Hattie, there's nothing that our Hattie is a device that specifically we had made for us. Uh, we do not make the indicators. We had it made for us. Uh, the standard one only has, only will take a load cell with about two and a half millivolt output, I believe. And we had one specially made so it could handle uh, the four millivolt. So we need to, you need to look at that too. Uh, if you're using a cell that has a four millivolt output or three millivolt output uh, indicator that only that maxes out at two and a half millivolts is not going to be good enough. Uh, people get into that situation and then they play with resistors to cut the resistance down. And now you've, now you've introduced another error with temperature compensation and everything else. And now your spec sheets not valid for the load cell on the environmentals. So be careful, be careful with the direction you go price. Obviously, we don't all have unlimited budgets where we can buy the very best. Not everybody in this in this world's driving a Bugatti or you know whatever whatever high end car that you want to think about. Uh, typically, we're driving uh, you know Toyotas, Fords, whatever to work, uh, and not uh, <laughs> and not Bugatti. So they get us they get us from the destination. We feel safe. They might give us a little bit more bells and whistles, comfortable seats or whatnot. Uh, a radio that works, heaters, air conditioning that works. But yeah, we want we want to buy something that meets our needs and maybe maybe goes above our needs and has has some bells and whistles that make life a, a bit easier. Ease of use, ruggedness. If I'm in a harsh environment, 
you know, maybe I don't want something that if I drop it, it's going to break. I want something that I at least could could withstand a fall of a you know a couple feet. Number of load cells and channels required. This one's really. This one I like a lot because it says all your eggs in one basket. Am I better off to buy several indicators and lessen my risk in case uh, Murphy happens, in case, uh, you know, a technician runs over something, in case something drops? Because if your indicator goes, if you have five or six load cells on an indicator and it starts to go bad, you're going to be having five or six loads, more than likely five or six load cells or whatever equipment you have. Uh, it's going to be recalibrated. It's going to have to be calibrated again, and that's a big expense. So maybe portability-wise, everything else, maybe we want to limit our risk and put you know two or three on one indicator. Depends on how you how you work. Right calibration provider uh, will work with you to replicate how the uh, instrument's being used. And ensures via contract review that they can meet your requirements. Hopefully they do this. Lots of people. Over promise and under deliver. Not only in this world, not only in the calibration world. That's just a that's a blanket statement on. I don't know how people are dealing with, but if you're dealing with vendors, it's uh, this world is becoming crazy. Uh, we have some vendors where it's almost like a favor that they're they're doing things for us. That's not us, uh, though. It does make it very difficult when you when you rely on certain vendors outside for material needs and or you rely on certain vendors to do other things for you and you get the over promise and under deliver that never goes too well uh but that's again that's the world we live in that's basically common sense for everybody uh in the calibration side helps you make better measurements through communication you know here webinar today adapters hopefully people are learning something has a lead time that is acceptable we're hearing the horror stories of people waiting four to six weeks for their instrumentation our lead time right now, as of today, is about seven to eight business days. We can do sooner if requested, um, but if it goes in the queue with everybody else, it's about seven to eight business days. If something's urgent, we always work with our customers, and we do have expedite fees if somebody does need it sooner than that. Um, where lead time, we have quality checks in place where equipment's checked as it comes in the door. This is new the last two years. We used to wait till we calibrated it. Uh, we do our contract review and everything else. Then we would wait till we calibrated and we'd find that the customer didn't send a top adapter or anything else. So we have those checks built in now along the way. If you send us something today that's incomplete, we will call you shortly afterwards and say, we're missing this, this, this. Do things slip through the system? Of course they do. Um, though every every day, just try to be better and better and better because ultimately it impacts how we do business and it makes life easier for our customers. So on the lead time, that's how we're we're doing things. We have our we're always working on process flows, always using techniques to to try to get better. Uh, is rated well with the industry. You want to ask around on on calibration providers. How are they doing things? Ask the right questions. How many calibration providers are out there asking about adapters? Not many. Has uncertainties low enough to meet your requirements? And just remember, here's a better uncertainty chain. If you start, again, if you start at this level, the accredited calibration service su supplier, guess what? You cannot if we need to make a conformity assessment on a device that is 0.02% of full scale, we need a calibration provider that is likely better than 005. I've seen people get this math wrong. I, I see contracts were awarded to calibration providers that are 05 and the contract was awarded for a device that was 02. This cannot happen. That cannot happen. So if you want 0 0.02, ideally I say 0 0.005, you need to, all we know is it needs to be less, right? And then you plot it, do your, do your uh, you can do your probabilities, draw your curves, you can draw the uh, normal distributions, you do whatever else, calculate your risk, you do all of the stuff. But at the end of the day, 
if you want that conformity assessment, you cannot use a lab that has uh, calibration and measurement capability greater than the tolerance required. One way to start is checking the scope to ensure that it can meet the capacity. And if somebody wanted this, this is a typical, you know, some people that are doing cal say, hey, I need 0.01% of full scale. That's what they want, their secondary standards. So can this provider meet? This is our scope, so obviously we can. It's a loaded question. Can we meet it the whole way through? Maybe not. Uh, I can tell you it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult above 120,000 pounds. So if you want 01 better than 120,000, if you have a device that's 150,000 pounds and want 01, we're not going to be able to meet it. But if you have a device that's 120,000 pounds and want 01, we can. If you have a device that's 02, right? Right here we say bottom line 11.5. So 0.01 would mean we can do it at uh, right 111,000 and change. So, but I'm going to tell you now 150,000 pound. That's our one of our cruxes. We can do it to O2. We just can't do it to O1, and it all depends on various criteria. So, here's one. Uh, looking at this again after we just looked through it again, same. Everything else, you just look at much more room. Uh, this time through, I'm going to show it again, is looking at 2% risk or less. We're going to look at these numbers. This is what the device would have to read to pass the criteria. So we got 9990.747 versus 10,009.253. Uh, and when we look at this again, now we have 9992669. So that window has shrunk. And that's, again, that's all that we're doing. Uh, the commercial lab with, if you look at it, the commercial lab with a CMC of 0 0.05, uh, the PFA here goes to 21.641. So just looking at these numbers, you got to run them. It's very difficult. And you can look at the CPK again. So. Asking the right questions. These are some common questions. You may you might want to if you're if you are one of the commercial calibration providers, you might want to start asking these of your customers. How is the instrument currently being used? Uh, you can have different scenarios. What adapters are used with it? How is it loaded? Is a question. If the force device is loaded through the top shoulder or thread loaded. If thread loaded, how much engagement? If is the force device loaded through the bottom threads? Do you have a top lock that can be sent? Just all starts to it and some more example here. Here's an example of uh, two different adapters that were, this load cell was calibrated with these two different adapters. You look at it, output with one of the adapters was 10,001.5. That was with an inch and a half of engagement versus 9942.3 with a half inch of engagement. There was a difference of 59.2 pounds on a 10,000 pound load cell between these two adapters. So the error of the measurement was over a half percent on a device expected to be better than 0 0.025. So 20 times expected. So if that load cell is sent in without adapters, what is your calibration lab going to do? They're just going to calibrate it like always? And then you're going to use something that may or may not match? Additional good practices are validate, validate your processes, participate in uh, proficiency tests or ILCs. More, we are launching ILCs. We've uh, done a little bit with uh, Sapphire proficiency testing where we would calibrate a device in our dead weight machine load cell. We would send it to you immediately. This would be a blind instrument. You would use it to verify your equipment and then send the data to Sapphire PT for analysis, they would run the reports. Or we can send you an instrument that was calibrated in dead weight and you can use it to improve your process and then send it back. There's a charge for that. If anybody's interested, they can start contacting us. That service should be launched uh, somewhere around mid-November. It really closes that measurement assurance gap Train and invest in your people. 
And we all know that the labor force, the current conditions, it's it's hard to find. And then people that tra some people train people and then they go elsewhere. So what do you need to do as retention stat strategies? H how is how are you going to keep the morale up? Uh, the statistic on this is about 70 people, 70 percent of people leave uh, because of management and 30 percent leave uh, because of pay. So agree on definitions. Everybody got the measurement and certainty definition correct when we had a multiple multiple choice, but would we all agree on how we do our uncertainties? Would we all do them the same way? In hopes to help everybody, we have a CMC sheet available. Those that know us know that may have used it. We've, we've simplified it. We've written guidance for A2LA. Uh, guidance document uncertainties. We have all that stuff available on our website where, and the CMC sheet gives instructions on how to do your measurement uncertainty.